Right, so guys, are we ready? We'll get started. So um, just uh, first of all, thank you to Nick uh, for coming in and helping the kids in Hong Kong. Uh, hopefully we can learn a lot from him. Uh, there's a few coaches here. There's Stefan Eric, the uh, head of the National Training Centre, Andrea, Jackie, Bill, George, and there's a few coaches online and there's kids from quite a few different centres. So they'll all hopefully ask you some tough questions, Nick, to keep you on your toes. So I thought you said we had Stefan Edberg in there for a minute. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's me. Yeah, 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 a bit yeah, of weight, yeah, yeah, but you know, yeah, yeah. the serve's still there. From last time you met, yeah. changed a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's it. He's now my boss. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so quick intro to Nick. Yeah, uh, so Nick's a three time world champion, former world number one, two time Commonwealth gold medalist, Hong Kong Open champion, and uh, to prove there's more than just one, a uh, Sheffield Wednesday supporter as well. So there's uh, at least yes. two of us. So, uh, two? Yeah, me and Nick. I didn't know. Uh, and that's, um, <laughs> and I think in terms of Nick, uh, through his career, Nick was famous for being so hard working. Uh, on and off the court, uh, amazing athlete, and I think you uh, achieved many great things in your career through your work ethic. And um, yeah, so maybe if you can just give our kids a quick uh, recap of your journey, Nick, and uh, how you basically achieved what you did, if that's okay, and then they'll ask you yeah. some questions. Thanks, Mark. That's about the most compliments you've ever given me. I've known Mark a long time, and He's usually he was one of the people that helped keep me grounded when I was younger. Um, you know, if I got into the top ten, he said, "Why are you not top five? If I got into the top five, for example, he said, "Why are you not top four?" And so on. He was always one of those people who um, kept me grounded through the years, and he taught me a really good kick second serve at tennis as well. Um, we exchanged a few lessons at one point, and I think he probably helped me out more than I helped him out with his. Uh, with his squash. Um, well, no, hopefully you can learn one or two things. I know there's kind of sometimes a rivalry between the racket sports, but, you know, I think there is lots of crossovers too, and you can always learn things, even if the sport's completely different, you know, from the mindset about how people went about their training, how they kind of prepared as a junior. So, you know, hopefully um, could pass on some things. I actually played tennis a lot as, as a junior and I think that helped me a lot in squash. Um, I found that the psychology in the sports is quite different. You know, I kind of loved squash because I was in the same space as my opponent and I, I kind of fed off their energy. I felt like I could impart my body language on them because they were right next to me. Whereas in tennis, sometimes it's a lonely existence when the opponent's all the way over the other side of the net and you're in your own kind of world. So the psychology, whilst it's you against one other person or in doubles, two other people, it's, you know, it's kind of you're on your own. And um, I ended up just, um, because it maybe suited my personality a bit more, moving into squash, um, concentrating on squash when I was about 13 or 14. As I'm sure Mark told you, I wasn't one of the best juniors in the country, um, but kind of tried to make up for that with the work ethic and I really wanted to be a professional player and I realised that that was the goal. So the goal was in kind of six or seven years time and whilst I had little um, short-term goals along the way, I always looked at what I could do to be a professional rather than worrying about winning kind of a junior title along the way. I was just looking to improve and um, when I was 18, decided to go professional um, on um, the world tour. I actually came to Hong Kong for the first time in 99. So I've been coming out there a long, a long time. Um, did really well in Hong Kong the first couple of years I was there. Kind of made it through qualifying once. I just loved the hustle bustle of the place. I found it really inspired me. Um, then did really, really badly there for about eight or ten years. Um, until finally winning the tournament in 20. 13 kind of a long time after first coming so that kind of summed up my career in many ways didn't always get the kind of rewards for that hard work early on and then stuck at it stuck at it got some good advice worked hard and, and kind of got my rewards probably later on in my career into my 30s when I first got to world number one and when I first won my first world title and, and big tournaments like Hong Kong so I was very much a late developer and that held me through until I was 38 and I didn't retire until I was 
38, which is quite a long 20 year career on the tour. And then, yeah, here I am having turned 40 a couple of weeks ago, trying to impart my wisdom on the next generation a little bit more now. And uh, how are you finding the transition from uh, playing to coaching? It's tough. Yeah, I need to get some advice from you guys because, um, yeah, I think um, it's actually easier sometimes being on the uh, the playing side of things. You know, as a coach, you, you know, you're desperate to make an impact. You really want to help people and just the same lessons, really. You have to remember that it's a journey and, you know, things are not going to happen overnight. And um, I, I think when I first went into coaching, I was guilty about wanting to make an instant impact with players and actually you have to kind of settle in for that you know do them doing the right thing over a long period of time because it's definitely a journey no yeah that's good that's good so i think um following on from what you've said actually a lot of the questions are kind of linked to this so it should be quite good so basically we've got a number of kids uh, that have got special questions for you so stefan's going to uh, ask them to ask you the questions and see how you find them yeah First, first question. Uh, first question is going to be from Colton Chan. Colton, are you there? You can maybe unmute mute yourself and ask a question. Colton. Colton's got a cracker of a question as well. Yeah. <laughs> we can come back to him maybe. I don't know where he's. I looked through the list. I couldn't see his name. No. Uh, let me let me uh, read the question to you. Um, his question was, uh, your motto is work hard, no regrets. Uh, it's an interesting question, I think. How do you know if you have worked hard enough? Good question. Um, really good question. Well, that's a tough one to start things off, right? <laughs> um, I think, basically, when you're younger, you know, you get a lot of feedback from the coaches, you know, you, you're learning all the time, you know, you'll, you'll know it sometimes when you're younger, you have to kind of trade that off about, you don't want to injure yourself. For example, you're just learning how to get stronger. You've got to factor in things like growth and, you know, you have to be really sensible and have that really good plan so that you know the right times to work hard. But then as you get more and more information, I think it's a real personal thing. You know, I think, you know, we all, I used to know when I came home on an evening, you look at yourself in the mirror and if you were honest with yourself, you would know if you've given everything on that day. Um, you know, I used to feel a little bit guilty sometimes if I knew that actually I could have done a bit better today. I kind of cheated a little bit on that last set or something and, and that guilt feeling used to haunt me a little bit when I was sitting on the sofa trying to relax. And I only kind of got to the point that I truly relaxed when I knew that I'd given it my all. And that doesn't always mean working hard. It doesn't always mean, you know, your heart rate's at 200 and you're sweating completely and you're, and you're breathing, you know, you, and you're absolutely shattered. It could be attention to detail if you're working on a technical thing on your serve or your forehand, but you're just going all in and you're just concentrating as best as you can your heart rate might not go past 120 but you've just given it your best if you're watching a video you're concentrating you know because at the end of the day when we play sport you're only doing it for a relatively short period of time it's not like we're working nine to five you yeah. know so I always used to think well I'm only having to concentrate for an hour an hour and a half here so I might as well do it and then get to enjoy the rest of the day and I used to relax a lot more if I did that mm -hmm. all right thanks Thank you. Um, we're, we're trying to go a bit in chronologically through, uh, through your career now. Is, is there anything from juniors to, to seniors what changed that also will come back a bit in, the, in these questions? Uh, next question would be from Erica, Carl, Bob, Bethany, Michelle, uh, Tam Singham, Vienna and Ophelia. All of people wanted to sign the same area. So Erica or Bethany, could you ask your question about uh, junior titles? Maybe Erica, you go first. Can I unmute all? Erica. When you were a junior player and not being able to win nationals, what made you think or believe that what you're working on would pay off? Yeah, another good question. Um, 
I kind of had had faith in um, the process as best as I could. You know, it's so easy to, if you, if every disappointment you have, you lose faith in the process and you try and you get too down with it, then there's going to be too many ups and downs. You have to try to stay, and you're always naturally going to be down a little bit, but you've got to try not to, my dad always used to say to me, as a good saying, try not to get too high with the highs and try not to get too low with the lows. Again, if you have a vision of where you want to go, there's going to be lots of ups and downs in that period. You've just got to try and not let that down last for a week, two weeks, because that's just going to affect your training. You know, you've got to bounce back quite quickly. Um, when I when I was in the Nationals, I, when I was younger, I was never really in a position to win them. I was always improving. The next year, I would always get a little bit further than I'd done the year before, so I could see that improvement. I got to the under-19s, and actually, I was seeded one for the first time, and I lost in the semi-finals and was nervous throughout the week. And I was obviously very disappointed about that, but it was a really good learning curve for me because it was the first time I'd ever been the favourite. It was the first time I'd ever been expected to win. And yeah, I just didn't cope with it very well. But, you know, I spoke to my coach, spoke to my dad, and we just kind of said, look, until you put yourself in that position, you don't know how you're going to react. So next time you're in that position, you'll be a lot more experienced from it and you'll know what you have to do. And and that was kind of how we viewed um, kind of not winning nationals on that occasion. That was good, yeah. Thank you. Um, Lionel, maybe you're there for the next question, following up on that uh, regarding expectations. I think Lionel has to find to unmute himself. Cool again? Yes, Lionel, we hear you. He unmutes himself, but he still stop the video <laughs> <laughs> you want to ask the question yes um before you came world champion and world number one ranked did you expect you can reach this high level and what and how did you make it happen Oof. i think um I don't know if I believed that I could get to world number one. I certainly worked hard for it. I think sometimes you have a kind of a goal, but then above that you have a dream goal, which is kind of something that's, you know, you don't know if it's realistic or not because you're still a long way away from it, but that's your ultimate ambition. And of course my ultimate ambition was to become world number one and world champion, but I kind of didn't really know whether it was possible. Um, I had believed my coach told me from a very young age he thought that I he could help me get to the top 10 if I listened and worked hard and then up, after that he kind of said it's up to you and I didn't quite know what he meant by that um because I thought well surely the coach is still going to help you when you get uh, if you do get to this kind of a top 10 and I realized that the subtleties the small differences between being 10 and say two or two and one are just something that you have to kind of figure out in your own head and it wasn't until I got there that I kind of knew what he meant. And it happened kind of quite quickly. I remember working really hard and being a top 10 player and then being there for two or three years, couldn't quite make the breakthrough. And then I actually had shoulder surgery. And I had some enforced six, seven months off the court where my ranking completely dropped. But it gave me a chance to reassess why did I never get higher than kind of eight why was I always stuck at eight or seven in the rankings you know it's not bad but how can I go higher and it just made me look at it from a slightly different angle and the psychology of, of why that was and when I came back it happened quite quickly within a year or so of coming back from the surgery I got to number one and um, it kind of happened so quickly you just kind of ride the wave a little bit and, and I think that happens wherever you are in sport once you get on that kind of momentum and the confidence you know you keep going with it you keep doing what you're doing and um, there wasn't one thing in particular that I changed other than realizing what I was good at I think the time off from the injury made me realize I'm an all-rounder I'm seven out of ten at everything but I'm not 10 out of 10 at anything. And it made me realize that I have to kind of work on my strengths if I want to become the best, not just the weaknesses. 
Oh, wow. That's an important one, I think. I think that happens maybe to a lot of people. Um, I think when you're young, obviously, when you're young, you know, you, you're just ironing out and you want to have that all-round game. That's fine. And then it's kind of like you got to a certain point and it was hard to see what I needed to improve because tournaments just come so fast all the time. Every week you're playing another tournament. So there's sometimes not chance to actually take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And of course, I wouldn't have wished for having surgery and six months off, but it actually gave me a chance to look at it from a different angle and realise that I need to beat these players. I don't. I can't just be steady and solid. Um, eventually, they're going to beat me, and it, and it and it just came. I, I came back and I, I started to attack the game a little bit more and took my game to them and stopped worrying about my opponents as much and tried to concentrate on what I was going to do to them. Yeah, perfect. Um, let's say, do we have Carl there for the next question? Because uh, the next area where a lot of people are wondering about, because when they watch squash, they obviously uh, realize it's one of the most physical sports there are. And you don't really see unfit people in the top. So, Carl, maybe uh, Carl, some, some, Hannah, Naomi, Eric have the same question. So, Carl, can you ask a question? Uh, so, my question is, how do you handle nervous when you play against the people that are like the same level as you? Maybe sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Or maybe uh, he, he never beat at you. Like... How do you handle the nervous when you play against them or him? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. That has, um, for me, that has two parts to it, an, an answer to that. And I think one is, you know, you see it as a learning journey. You know, on the days that you went really well, what did you do differently on that day and the days where it didn't go so well? What could I do better on these days? And you try to put that into the recipe for the next time. That's the first thing. The second way of handling nerves, I actually remember Mark might remember this, but for a few years, we had a really big tournament in Sheffield at the Crucible where they have the World Snooker. And I used to feel so much more nervous at that tournament than any other because it was a home tournament. I had all my friends come in to watch, I had all my family, and I just wanted to do so well that I was nervous. And I found myself basically concentrating or thinking about things that I had no power over I had no control over so I'd worry about whether my friends could get a ticket I'd worry about I didn't want to lose in front of my friends I was wondering if everyone's watching me thinking am I playing well and actually had a good way to handle nerves is just to concentrate on just the things that you can control so when you're playing that opponent you don't need to worry about who's watching. You don't need to worry about the weather. You don't need to worry about what they're thinking. All that you can focus on is your next shot. You know, what you're going to do with your next move. How are you going to see? So you just take it in one step at a time and just concentrate on one thing and something that you can do something about. And for me, that used to kind of break the nerves down so that you could focus on you were focusing on something really small and then it, it took the nerves. Nerves are not a bad thing, by the way. You know, it's okay to have a few nerves. I think that's a sign, as long as you handle them well, it's a sign actually that your body is anticipating doing something different, doing something special. So as long as you don't let them overwhelm you, they can be a really important tool to playing well. I think following on from that question as well, Nick, uh, you had a famous rivalry against another guy from England and didn't you win 19 straight matches against him so it was uh, how did you manage to keep beating James tournament after tournament yeah I think James Wilstrot we you had a big rivalry I think we played something like you know you say I looked at the Federer and Nadal stats and I think they played something like 80 times or and actually James and myself played on the world tour 86 times so it's kind of a lot of times to play somebody um and I just, everyone was telling you all of these stats, basically how many times you'd beaten him in a row, this and the other. And I just tried my best to just not listen to any of that. And just every time I played him, just it was like we'd never played before. And I had to play um, the next shot, as simple as that. We had a little bit of a rivalry in terms of we clashed personally as well. And I always tried to not involve that as best as I could you know sometimes if you don't really like somebody it can affect your mindset so I always tried to just focus on the ball focus on the next shot and focus on what I could do and, and that that took the nerves out of the system but 
as I said, like nerves can be, there was a sign when I used to train in the gym, the squat rack that I used to pick, there was a sign above it. And um, they always had the motivational signs in the gym, you know how it goes. And this one said, if you're not nervous, you're not ready. And I always really like used to like that one because I think nerves are often seen, so you know, I'm nervous, it's a bad thing. But the bigger the match, the bigger the occasion, you probably feel more nervous. And that's a good thing because your body's adrenaline is ready to do something special. You know, Olympic champions, people who break a world record in athletics or something, they will say that that nervous energy helped them go two inches further or something, as long as you channel it in the right way. That's yeah. good. I think that's a good idea about like gives a bit more idea about some follow up question also regarding pressure that that's already a bit answered like that. So you focus on these kind of things. Um, uh, to come back on the fitness part, which we shortly brushed, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if Carlos there is uh, maybe Hannah there. Andy Roddick is there, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, not you now, please. It's calling a good face. Uh, Hannah though, Shen, can you ask a question about the demanding sport? Doesn't look like it, huh? Mm. Um, a bit of a longer question. Let me ask that because like one, two, three, four, five people asked that actually. How would a day program, because they're a bit impressed, like I said earlier, about the physical demands of the sport, how would a training day look like versus a tournament day? Okay, yeah. Um, well, my training, my training phases kind of changed throughout my career um early on i would train six days a week at least twice a day um i progressed to taking an extra half a day in the weekend in the middle stage of my career and then at the end i was getting a little bit older i took the full weekend so it was five days and, and two sessions a day obviously if you're in an off-season period that would look different than if you were building up for a tournament there'd be kind of more sharpness but a typical training day when i was off um, when I was away from tournaments might be going to the gym in the morning so it would be going to see my trainer doing some physical work um, you know good mobility warm-up some strength work and then some dynamic kind of plyometrics or circuit to finish off with you know to really challenge the specifics of the sport I'd then um, take some lunch and in the afternoon go um, on court and either hit with my coach or some other players and and have a kind of really specific session and would usually always then finish off with 20 minutes just hitting on my own just to kind of fine-tune maybe my attacking game just a little bit static a little bit more technically just trying to fine-tune everything that I've done um, that day and then usually finish off with a good stretch look after the body maybe a massage maybe some physio um, uh, before heading home and yeah, when I'm home, I used to try to, re I think rest is as important as anything as well. When you're actually resting, that you want to try to rest as best as you can um, so that you're ready to do it again the next day. Just one more. Uh, in a tournament, in a tournament, completely opposite. So the morning session, you'd have a light warm up, probably only hit, you know, the sessions in the in training were probably more like 90 minutes to two hours when you include warm ups. Um, in, in a tournament day, it would be, 40 minute hit max like 30 minute hit sometimes so you're just really just getting on the court that you're about to play on nothing too intense um just opening up the body um a little bit of a stretch afterwards or foam roll or something and then usually you would play late at night so you go back rest eat sleep relax completely and then get ready to play um in the evening so a tournament day will be much, much lighter because um, you, you're resting for that evening's performance. Um, just one more quick question from me, actually, because I know with the squash, you guys do a, a lot of solo training on your own. And that's something, obviously, with tennis, everyone always thinks they have to have a player to play against, you know. But obviously, here yeah. at our centre, we have practice walls. You can do serves. Like when you, because I know you do it so much and it's so important to your training, what do you focus on when you're doing your solo training? I had to, I used to have two kind of, I mean, obviously lots of variations, but I guess they would fall into two categories. One would be 
more where I was working a technical one. So I was practicing a specific shot. So even if I went around and practiced different shots, I was working on one shot at a time. Um, and it wasn't so much for a solo practice. It wasn't a physical workout. It was more of a technical one. And then the other category would be one where involved a lot more movement. So I might kind of hit for 10 minutes and then do some ghosting, which in squash, that's basically movement without the ball or a little bit of skipping or something to get my heart rate up so that then I would practice the next set when I picked the ball up while my heart rate was high. And I used to find that that was a good way of practicing because it's kind of replicating the needs in, in a match. Um, everyone can hit a lovely um, serve or in squash a drop shot when your heart rate's low. But, you know, I wanted to try and practice that shot when my heart rate was a little bit higher sometimes so that it replicated the, the match. Um, so I, they fell in one of the two categories, really. Um, I used to kind of back in the day we didn't have this luxury, but now you've got the, the you know the ear pods and stuff. You can always listen to your music while you're doing it, which I think if you're going to practice on your own makes it a little bit more interesting. I used to have wires hanging down and iPods falling out of pockets while I was trying to hit, and it was a disaster. Um, so I think now you've got that luxury, and you know you just shut yourself off and go into your own zone, and you just play around with the racket and and practice different shots, and you know. Um, I always used to view solo as maybe something that my opponents weren't doing because everyone does a certain amount of the similar things. I always used to view that as something, right, well, how can I gain that little um, advantage on them that, that they might be too bored to do or something? All right. All right. Good. Good Thanks. Yeah. Um, Yi uh, also has a question about during a match. So let's say if you're uh, during a match, uh, probably a challenging match, Yi, do you want to ask that question? Um, what would you do if you are extremely exhausted in a match? Yeah, it's a good question. I would um, probably think that I need to train harder before the next one. Uh, um, I think, yeah, you know, when you get into these tough moments in a match, whether it's, you know, the fifth set, the fifth game in squash, and, you, you know, you're tired, you, you know, you have to really, really keep things so simple because the brain is not going to be functioning on anywhere near the same level of, um, of energy that it was at the beginning when you're fresh. So you really have to think, right, think about one thing and one thing only and just focus on that one thing and commit to it. If you start trying to think about too many things or start thinking about you're tired, you're going to let those negative thoughts creep in. You know, you have to remember that if you're tired, your opponent will be tired as well, you know, so don't ever forget that. And, um, yeah, really focus on one thing. So you're kind of taking the score out of it. You're taking whether you're fresh or whether you're tired out of it. You're just concentrating again on something that you can control. Okay. You saw you come back from 2-0 down against Lee Beach or once. That would have been at Sheffield, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, I I remember that match. My mum actually crashed a car after it because she couldn't believe that I'd won. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, if, for example, you're two sets down or you're two games down, you have to view it in small chunks. You know, you can't think... If you think, oh, I've got to win three more sets, that's a long way back. Um, you know, you win the next game and then the ne you win the next point, sorry, and then you win the next game and then so on and so That would add up after a little bit of time um you know if you don't win the next game you're kind of out of the match if you don't win the next set you're out of the match you don't need to think about winning and losing at that point you kind of break it down into those smaller chunks and you hope that they add up um in the end no, no. Sorry, thanks. um shiana uh, if you're uh, if you're online uh, can you ask your question regarding the training goal <laughs> How was that, was <laughs> that was not me. That was not me. That was not me. What's the screen? Wait, what? What's the screen? Sorry? I was Someone trying to work out what your me. background was. Oh, it's space. Space, right. Got you. Yeah. Um, wait, which question would you like me to ask? 
The question regarding the, the goals, short term, long term. The third one or the fourth one? Uh, <laughs> choose whatever you like. Okay. Um, sorry? You, you can kind of, either or, they're both very good. Okay. Uh, okay. Throughout the course of your career, did you have single minded long term goals? And was everything you did with that long term perspective? So that, like, therefore, you didn't worry about, for example, not winning as a junior. Yeah, good question. I think um, I think you always have to have where you want to be in the end in mind, you know, because that will keep you kind of level, as I said before, rather than getting too excited if you win your club championships, for example, or getting too down if you don't. Um, uh, so you're always important to have that long term vision of where you want to be in mind so that you can refocus on the next session but yeah of course you have to have these short-term goals because that's what motivates you to get out of bed in the morning that's what motivates you to want to keep pushing if you have those little targets along the way but I think what you have to remember with those targets is even if you don't achieve them they've still been a really good thing because they motivated you so for example if your target was to win the next junior title you were playing and that really motivated you in this period if you don't win it you know there's no point you know you don't want to get too disappointed because actually you still probably put in some really good work that will go towards the long-term goal in that period and you just then say right okay what's my next target and you know work towards that and what's your next one the the most important thing is maybe getting the mix of um of the two things you know it's not just long term it's not just short term you have to kind of keep an eye on both i think because they'll both help you along along the way and, and most of the time you might not achieve your goals or if you if you achieve your goals all of the time maybe they're too easy and you know the coaches need to help you uh challenge you a little bit more yes that answers your question tiana yes thank you all right uh, Perth Sane would like to answer, uh, ask a question. If there was, if there was one thing in your career you, you could change, what would it be? Oh, oh. Big question. <laughs> no, no. Actually, you know, it was probably something right at the end of my career. So, in in my last season, I. I had three titles of a lot of things. So I, I won three world championships. I won three British Opens, which is kind of like the Wimbledon. And I won three Commonwealths. And on the last season, I kind of called it Project Four. I wanted to just get four of something. I didn't care which one it was, um, but I wanted to get four. And I actually probably didn't follow my own advice that I just gave Shiana there. And I think I put too much pressure on myself, maybe because it was my last season. I wanted to go out on such a high point. Um, I think it was the Commonwealth Games one that I put the most pressure on because I was seeded one in that, in the Worlds and the different things. My ranking had dropped a little bit by then. So I didn't play with too much pressure on those ones. But the Commonwealth in the Gold Coast in Australia, I, I really wanted to win that one. And, and I went out there and I lost in the quarter final, and I just put way too much pressure on finishing as a fairy tale ending. Uh, I wanted, you know, to go out with the, yeah, just like the perfect ending to a long career. And I realized afterwards, probably too late, that that didn't exist. I had to do all the same things I spoke about before. No one was just going to hand me the trophy just because they felt sorry for me that it was my last year, you know. And, and I probably put too much pressure on myself and actually came full circle to when I was under 19 and I put too much pressure on myself to be succeeded one. And, yeah, if I could have maybe had a match again, I would have uh, played that one and, and learnt from it. Okay. That's a good one. Would you say that you should, like that one thing, you, you strayed away from the basics? Yeah, I just probably strayed away from everything that I'd lessened, that I'd learned in my whole career. You know, it was foolish, really, 20 years, but maybe just because it was my last season and I think the Project 4 thing was was really good, as I said to Shiana, because it, it did motivate me on that last season. Whenever I was down, I was like, no, no, come on, this is what's going to... If I felt like resting that day, this is what was going to push me through. And it did motivate me, but then maybe I built it up too much. So I was thinking about all these things that I couldn't control, like, you know, 
trying to lift the trophy or whatever or have the medal around your neck and you know you had to hit many balls before that was possible and I maybe kind of lost sight of of that really um perhaps that and obviously I would have loved to have become an Olympian as well I think you know it's a big disappointment for squash players that we're not yet an Olympic sport uh I would have loved to have played um in the Olympic Games, particularly when we had London 2012 um that would have been amazing Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, we have one more big question. And big one. From our space star, Sienna. Can you go for the big last one? <laughs> Biggest piece of advice. Sienna. Maybe it goes on without knowing. Yeah. Sienna, Sienna. You're back? Sorry, I just lost you there. Yeah, we, we got to for a moment. Sienna, you there? Yeah, you, Sienna. Me? Yes. Wait, me? Uh, I can't hear anyone. Biggest Wait, piece of advice. Me? Oh, oh, my bad. Like, What would be your biggest piece of advice on how we should have no regrets? I wish I had kind of the, um, I wish I kind of had a bit more. I think um, it comes down to what I said earlier about just knowing and looking yourself in the mirror and just saying like, you know, have I given my all today? If I have, and for example, the other person's better than you on that day, that's okay. You can live with that. You know, if you've given your absolute best and you tried your hardest and you, you know, you gave it the 110% and that person just beat you on that day, you can say, okay, that's fine. I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to come back stronger the next time. Um, I think for me, I was always happy with that if I knew that I gave it my best. Um, the only time I kind of was down was if you felt like you could have done better. And, you know, there's always something you could have done better. Like, for example, you missed a volley or something, but that comes down to a moment in time. That's not anyone's fault. But I'm talking about more like attitude and um, application and concentration and, and those sort of things, like I said, that you could control yourself. As long as I gave work ethic, as long as I gave all those things in there and actually enjoyed it as well. I used to enjoy it when I was competing. I loved just giving it my all and you forget about everything else. You know, you forget about who's Instagramming you or what homework you've got to do or because you just lost in the focus of that match. And I just used to look, that's probably the thing I missed the most. So by no regrets, I would just kind of say, just go all in, leave it out there and if it's not good enough on that day, then great. Use that to motivate you to come back um, next time. Fantastic. Yeah, Thank perfect. you. Right. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, we'll yep. round it up. Yep. Oh, Paf's got a question. Oh, on, Paf. Oh, one, 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 Paf. one more. One more. What do you think the best thing to do is um, if you have a like before a match, if it's really close to your house. If it's close to your house? Yeah, like before a match. So Nick, imagine you're playing at Hallamshire, I guess. That's that's close to your house, so. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, you you have to, for me, like, that's a, it's a good one. I see lots of players when there's a, say, there's a junior tournament and they're staying in a hotel two minutes away, they actually don't prepare properly because they, they're too almost too close to it so you can kind of be to me you know you want to be getting into that that match mentality that you're ready to play at your best you can't just click your fingers and do that uh, instantly it might take you know it might take half an hour little by little and you, you need to prepare as if you're away from home and you don't know anything and you you know if you're away from home you might get down to the venue like an hour or something before the match and then you're going to get your rackets ready and you're going to get everything ready whereas if you live close you might think oh, I only need to be there 10 minutes before 
and mentally you're not kind of tuned in. So I would advise to prepare the same way as if you're away from home and you don't know anything and you need to get everything ready. Like I used to hate rushing around last minute for like a, a bottle of water or whatever you need. And, you know, I think that you, you need, sometimes you can be too comfortable when it's close to home. So you need to treat it as if, um, you know, it's, it's the same way and you need to travel. Okay. All right. Good. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nate. Uh, we had a lot of participants. We had like 62. We had uh, all the national centers actually following today. We had Chun Moon, we had Causeway Bay, uh, yeah. Turtle East. So we are on the highest uh, attendance so far from all the things. So, and I think it was very much worth it. So, very, very uh, appreciated. And thank you very much for it. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, Hopefully the kids have taken uh, lots from it and they can take it uh, back on the court. And uh, hopefully you can go and enjoy your work on the court now in half an hour. So that's, uh, <laughs> but yeah, thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, great. Yeah. Thanks. And I'm honoured that Djokovic and Roderick were with us, amongst <laughs> others. It was, it was nice to speak to those legends. Yeah, they also learn from it, hopefully. <laughs> You'll have to change your background next time to... Uh... No, I've got my, I've got my, um, my career... Um, <laughs> oh, that's not there you go. I've got my career uh, photo there. That's cool. <laughs> that's brilliant. Right, thanks, right. Alex. I'm sure the kids all, all want to say thank you as well. So thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you all in hot. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.